Thank you. Okay, so this tutorial is going to be uh, NLP with PyTorch. Uh, we're going to do some recap on NLP, uh, basic of uh, neural nets, and then we're going to go further in the second part into more recent developments in NLP. Hopefully, it gives you a sense of how do you build uh, more recent deep learning networks uh, to train those models. So before we start, um, here's the link to the slides. And there, the second link is to all the notebooks. So it's hosted on GitHub. Uh, I also posted it in the Slack channel of tutorials, where you can just go directly. And then also on that GitHub, you'll have the link to the slides. OK. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you how you're going to open up Collab and run your notebook with it. So you go to Collab. GitHub, <laughs> search for Scout B, and then make sure that you're on the develop branch. Here we have the updated notebooks. And you can see here there are six different notebooks that we can run through. Uh, you can just uh, click one of them, and then I will show you how. Okay, let me quickly drag it up. Um, yeah, so we specifically make the notebooks in a way that it doesn't take too long to run. So you can, while we we're giving the slides, you can run it on this side as well. Um, what is really good is that uh, it also gives you a runtime of a GPU. So you can just connect, and then you're connected to a GPU, which takes much faster to run through all the cells. Okay. Good. So quick disclaimer, so we won't be have the time to run through all the notebooks one by one, but you can run it on the side, follow through the, the, the steps I just showed you. Um, yeah, and let's get started. So I'm Jeffrey, and that's Susanna, my teammate. Uh, we are both data science people in Scout B, and our five second promotion, uh, we are an AI powered B2B sourcing platform in Germany, we're a startup. Uh, we are very data science biased, so we're always constantly looking for data enthusiasts, deep learning people, uh, Python engineers. We're fully Python based. Uh, check out scalpy.com. <laughs> All right. Um, so pre prerequisites and goals. Uh, we assume that you have some machine learning exposure, and then you are somehow intermediate Python coder, or you p use Python day to day. Yeah and you understand what the basics of neural nets so that when we're introducing the uh, PyTorch way of building neural nets, it's um, easy for you to follow. The goals of this is that we want to go, go give you a recap of deep learning and then take that part to the second where we can say how do we uh, help you build a deep learning based NLP model, a more recent developments, uh, for instance, like sequence to sequence models, or trans doing transfer learning, fine tuning, et cetera. Okay, uh, that's going to be the outline. So the first part is going to be introducing PyTorch. Uh, some of you might have already known uh, these things static versus dynamic basics. And then we're going to do a recap on the neural nets. How do you train a basic feed forward network in PyTorch? define your loss functions, do gradient descents, et cetera. We're going to also do a slight recap on NLP basics, uh, but also in PyTorch. And how do you do text preprocessing, how to represent your text into a discrete space, et cetera. And then we're going to more recent stuff, uh, how the uh, continuous representation works with embeddings, um, uh, then we're going to do RNNs, which are sequence models. Um, how does it work? Different types of that. How do you do text generation or sentiment classification with RNN? And then we do the more recent sequence models, which uh, happens within these two years. Um, those models are then the basic of uh, recent developments you see in transfer learning. So things like GPT-2, uh, 
and uh, BERT, etc., and I give you a um, basic understanding of why is it useful. Okay. Um, so Susanna is gonna go start with the PyTorch intro. I guess I can't talk there because I have this one. Yeah, just talk. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk about how PyTorch works um, and where PyTorch fits in the overall deep learning library ecosystem. Okay, so this is a cool graph Karpathy put on his Twitter. Uh, it might be kind of hard to see, but the purple one, the dark purple one is PyTorch, so it's this line here. And then we also have uh, TensorFlow, which is the pink one at the top. Uh, so you can see TensorFlow is still very dominant in academic research for deep learning, but PyTorch is on the rise. And of course, this doesn't include 2019 and the year ends at 2018. Uh, so the, to talk about deep learning libraries, we first want to talk about what they do, like what's their primary objective. So we want to be able to define a model, a loss function, some kind of optimizer. Uh, so we want to define how our matrices process and how the model is set up to learn. And then we want to also support automatic differentiation, which is backpropagation. So we have this ecosystem where we have a bunch of these deep learning libraries. Uh, you might recognize some of them. PyTorch is the one that just spun, if you don't recognize the updated logo. Uh, yeah, so a common factor that I think differentiates these two the most in terms of how their API is structured is whether they are a, oh yeah, there it is, <laughs> whether they are a static versus uh, dynamic deep learning library. Um, so uh, if you look on the green, those are dynamic, so this includes PyTorch, Dynet, Chainer, and then the more traditional ones with TensorFlow, Keras, Fiano, I guess it's more outdated now. Um, H2O for PyTorch, this is all uh, static computation graphs. So when we talk about those, what's the difference? So for a static computation graph, the whole idea is that we define how we want to have our model flow, and then we run it. So it's kind of like it has this kind of like compile step to it. So we define everything first, and then we feed data into it. Um, so there's actually some good advantages of doing it this way. This is how TensorFlow works, is where we can, it's easier to distribute this. Um, and it's also nice, it's, but it is more complex to code this because it's, uh, it, it doesn't work with your intuition, especially with Python being a dynamic language, an interpreted language, that we would imagine that the deep learning library API would also be more dynamic. So dynamic is defined by run instead of defined then run. So our computational graph of how we want to transform our matrices is defined on the fly. Um, so we want to be able, so a nice thing about PyTorch is that we can just throw a debugger anywhere and be able to look at what our matrices look like, what the dimensions are. You can't do this so easily in TensorFlow. Um, and there's some nice things you can do with those kind of models. And there's also, you're able to do some more complex kind of networks that you wouldn't be able to do in TensorFlow. But it's mostly, it's a lot more Pythonic to do it that way because it's interpreted language and yeah. Okay. So PyTorch is a deep learning library in Python. Um, so you can kind of think of it as ND arrays with GPU support, ND arrays being in NumPy. Um, so it looks a lot like NumPy arrays, but you can do gradients on them. Uh, yeah, so it does automatic differentiation and optimization and it has these dynamic computation graphs. So just a little bit of a, f a feel for the PyTorch syntax. So we can create tensors just like that. So you create tensors kind of just like a NumPy array. Uh, we can do support broadcasting, so if we do two times that, it will broadcast it to each element. So that's quite nice. Um, we can also send our tensor to a uh, device. So that device could be your CPU, or it could be the GPU. So CUDA is for the GPU. Uh, so what's cool about PyTorch is that we can define some variables here. So we have X and some, so we just have some variables at the top and we have weights and we require gradients to be calculated on our weights and then we type some more code and this graph starts to get more filled up. So we do some matrix multiplication, torch.mm mm is matrix multiplication. Um, so we have these operations and we're able to start building our graph um, and then we keep adding some operations and then we even add this other line. So you can see this computation and graph is being generated on the fly as we define our code instead of all in one step. And then if you wanna do the back propagation, you just do this dot backward command. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a little bit of um, then how do you use PyTorch, what she just showed, into building a very basic V4 network. 
So a bit of recap on neural nets um, or any model specifically. Uh, you have your inputs, which is your training data. Um, you feed it into the model, which can a uh, black box, uh, feed forward network, sequence network, whatever. Uh, it generates a prediction, giving it a probability, pr probability guess of that model or uh, a regression that is a number. And you use your target, which is basically the truth, versus this prediction, and you try to access how wrong is my model prediction on that. So you generate your loss function. Ideally, the lower the, the better. That means your prediction probability is very in sync with uh, what the target distribution is. And then you try to do some weight update. With that, you try to um, say, how do I go down this hill? So that, how do I change my parameters so that my loss will go down the hill? When you look at it from a math side, like assume like a basic uh, linear regression problem, you do matrix multiplication uh, so that you predict a very linear output fr uh, from the x input you give. So you predict this y hat, and normally use a root mean, root mean square error, or in this case, a mean square error, uh, to access how different is my prediction versus the target. And then you do gradient, and then you update your weights. Um, so that's how it looks like as a basic feed forward network. You have your inputs, and then you feed through hidden states. You do activation on each of the, each of the layers so that it can fit to any nonlinearity non um, in the world. Um, what is very useful about deep learning networks is that there's this universal approximation theorem. Um, that if you stack multiple layers together, it can actually approximate any function, any nonlinear function in this world. So in the end, you just need to stack more and more layers so that that model generates better towards different um, ranges of input. Um, and you have different kind of loss functions. Uh, here we show four kinds of common loss functions. Um, loss is important that it tells you how wrong your model is. So that gives your model a guideline of how should I update my weights. So for instance, if you're talking about regression problems, you probably mostly use L2 loss, which is the linear regression kind of loss I just showed you. If you're talking about classification kind of problems where your output is basically a prediction of the probability on the class, then you can use negative, <coughs> negative log likelihood. Uh, basically, it's a a synonym for maximum likelihood um, estimation or cross entropy, uh, which is actually optimizing the KL divergence so that it goes lower. You can use each other. Uh, one is regression, the other one is for classification. Um, throughout this tutorial, mostly if we're, we're predicting for a class, we'll use cross entropy for it. Okay. So how exactly do you do go by that in PyTorch? Uh, you initiate a class. This is already built in. So NN is actually a module within PyTorch that you can just call. And I said, I want cross entropy loss. This gives you this class. And then when you're calculating your, uh, your loss, then you use the prediction versus the, your prediction from the model versus the target. You can feed it also the batch so that uh, your input size is then the batch number by one axis, and then the other size is your prediction. And then it calculates through these predictions and gives you the cross entropy estimate for it. So that's your prediction, and then that's your target, your truth. And then when you're doing gradient descent, after you have built this computational graph in your models, uh, you want to update your learning rate. Uh, you want to update your parameters. So you set the learning rate, which can be dynamic or can be static. Um, and right now, everyone uses dynamic. For instance, optimizers like Adam that tunes that and it goes by the, your surface of loss pretty well. Uh, but PyTorch does it for you. So you have a loss surface, which can be, in this case, two, two parameters. It can be undimensional space, where you have a surface in this hyperspace. 
and you're trying to find the position on this graph that lo minimize your loss. And when you project it to 2D, it goes like that. You want your model to be able to, after each train, after each up, uh, parameter update, you want your model to be able to walk slowly down the hill till the point where is the minimize and loss. That means your model is actually doing a good job of predicting the target. In PyTorch, what you do is quite straightforward. So you have to find your loss function, and you're feeding your prediction versus your target to get the loss, which is a scalar, uh, which is a number. Um, and you do backward, which is actually taking gradient uh, of this loss, the scalar loss, versus the computational graph. Within your computational graph, you already defined the weights, so the Ws before. Your X is your input, your W is your weights. You already predefined these weights so that when you call backward, it's actually going to compute the gradient on the fly and then store those gradient on the variables. And then the second step is then you call optimizer.step. Because when you initiate your optimizers, it already knows that which are the parameters I will want to update for each of the gradient. So it actually multiplies the learning rate, which in this case is dynamic, uh, with the gradient that you have applied to on the variables, and then updates the weight for you. So that's it. Actually, four lines of code. You define your computational graph, which is a matrix multiplication. You define your loss. You feed in your prediction. And then you just let Py mm. PyTorch do the rest. OK, so if you're training, if you're writing your own feed for neural net, uh, I'm going to show you how you can write with a few two, three basic uh, class. Then you can do your own feed for prediction, uh, feed for network. That's how you would uh, actually take your data set in Python. You can load it with pandas or something. And then how do you transform that into a uh, object that PyTorch can understand? Um, you initiate a class, uh, depending on what your data set is. I, in this case, it's our data set. And you inherit the class from data set, which is from PyTorch built-in. Uh, within in it, when, it, when you're initializing it, um, you can do whatever operation you want on top, right? So I read my pandas data frame, I tokenize my words, I do uh, transformation into vectors, etc. those operations, and I store on this class so that when I call the class, it returns me uh, the input and the target. And you would always need to define these two uh, methods for the class. Uh, it's by default required by PyTorch so that you can call an item by an index. So I initiate my, my data set uh, as an object. And then when I do index, like a square bracket i, a zero, it gives me the first record. That's what get item is, does for you. And then you have to write one for, uh, for length so that when you uh, call len by the data set, it gives you how many records you're actually having within this data set. And that's how you initialize it. So you just call my data set. Maybe you will feed in a, a path where you want to read your, uh, your Python file. Uh, no, Python, sorry. Uh, where you want to read your data file. And then you can index, call by index, or you can call by size. Okay, so now, we, so now you have loaded your data. How do you do your models? And that's a base, very basic uh, feed forward network, how it looks like in PyTorch. Uh, it's inherited from a different class, and then the module, uh, basic neural net module. So I said I want to create my first classifier, yeah, uh, which is a binary classifier of zero and one. When I initialize it, when I initialize it, I give it three layers, FC1, FC2, and FC3. Um, they're all linear layers. And you see by the size of the, the brackets, actually telling it which is my weight size. By default, since you're calling linear layer, uh, PyTorch understands this not as numbers, but as variables. Numbers are things that don't change while you're doing differentiation or somehow, things like your input, like your target. You don't want your uh, model to update your input data or update your output data. 
but variables are things that it can train. So if you call requ requires grad equals truth on any variable that you have defined, that PyTorch will interpret like if I have a computational graph, I'm doing a backward pass on it, I can update those values. And linear layer is one of those. So essentially you're initiating three uh, attributes or objects underneath this my classifier uh, by size of 128, 32, and then with the second pass, I want down from 32 to 16 and down to one. One means it's one or zero. So, and then you have a second forward path uh, method, uh, which means I initiate my class, which is my model, and then you said model, input data, then it's gonna go through the forward path. This is where PyTorch actually built up this dynamic computational graph, and then it calls it by sequence. So you say I take the input, I feed it, feed it, feed it through the first layer, I give it a nonlinear activation called ReLU, which is a rectifier. Uh, you can Google rectifier. It's basically taking the max between zero and the value. So it actually dims out all the negative values. Take those input. It's already a nonlinear output. Feed it through the second layer. Does the same thing. And then feed it through the last layer. And the output size, I give a sigmoid activation, which basically outputs uh, between zero and one bounded. And that's my computational graph. When I initialize this class by that, and I said to CUDA means uh, it's sending to your GPU, yeah? And you can send it to, to device. You can initiate your device and then you say send it to device. Uh, it tells your GPU that there's this model available that sends uh, all your parameters to GPU. And then when you do model and you're feeding your own inputs, it's gonna call the forward path which basically builds up the graph. Okay, so you have your data set loaded. You have your model computational graph built. Let's see how do we do training on top. So you said you define number of epochs that you would want to train. In this case, 10 for instance, make it faster. And then loader is basically this um, data set that you have prepared, so you split that your data set into batches, say each batch is like 512 uh, records. So your inputs and your target is gonna be both a tensor of batch size versus uh, the input size. I call the, I already initialized my optimizer, say Adam, and I tell my initializer that, I tell my optimizer that please zero out all the gradients of the variables because I don't want the previous run's uh, gradient to affect what I'm trying to do right now. So I zero that out and I do the forward pass. It's simple as after you initiate a model, you say model, give it an input, and you predict the output, which is in this case also in the same shape of batch size and your prediction. So you take your target, batch size prediction, uh, batch size truth and batch size prediction, you feed it through your loss function, you get the loss, which is a scalar, and then you do backward. When you call backward, PyTorch does this uh, gradient descent, for, uh, gradient for you automatically. So it does automatic uh, differentiation of that, and then you call optimizer that step. Goes to number of epochs as you defined, and then update those weights. So that goes down the hill. And that's pretty much it when, for how you build a very basic fee forward network. Oh yeah, so it goes through that. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a very quick breeze through of the NLP basics. Basically, how do you do text reprocessing and then how do you use PyTorch in the case of uh, NLP? Uh, some use cases where the real world NLP is using. Uh, for instance, language comprehensing, uh, things like uh, audio or my speech to text and uh, interpreting that text. Uh, for instance, like Alexa, you say, Alexa, please Google something. Uh, understands the text, understand your speech, turns that into text and understand that text. Uh, in this talk, we're gonna focus mostly on text to text or text classification kind of problems. So. Uh, we don't do audio files that much here. Um, 
Second use case, machine translation. So yeah, you use Google Translate, for instance. Um, you have a text, and your output is a text. In this case, uh, which we will, we will introduce later, how do you turn this sequence into a different sequence? And then text generation, or you give us some text as a seed, and you try to let the model start run, right, writing its own article. Or for instance, summarization, you give a very long text, can you find the most important parts of that text, and then use language model to generate a summary that makes sense. Yeah, like Google News. You see those like headlines or so. Uh, name entity re recognition. Um, this we use it a lot in Scalpy. Um, so we actually get a lot of those uh, free text from anywhere. But when we're trying to identify what is what, like, mm. does is it a company name? Is it a product name? Is it etc. It's all embedded within all these like full text from the websites. And NER actually does it for you. So it does tagging for the positions that it says this is a, uh, the class that you want to, that you have to find it for. So it says this is a company name, then we can ex extract that part out of that. So it's a lot with uh, information extraction. Sentiment analysis, things like uh, is it a positive review or a negative review? Am I happy with my text review, et cetera? So this is, a lot, uh, this is focusing on the text classification, which we'll also introduce. OK, so say you have your free text, long range of text, and then how do you turn that into this data set that I introduced in PyTorch, and then you can run your model on top? So first thing, you, you tokenize it. Uh, you're reading your file, and you have one column, which is like all these full text descriptions of some company. So first thing, you tokenize it. If you're, we are talking about Western languages, this is mostly how you would do tokenization, um, not covering things like Mandarin, Japanese, or so on. They're, they're different. Um, and then you would try to remove stop words, because those things, stop words are things like A, D, B, Etc. Those things give you very low signal. They're everywhere, so this gives you very low information of where of the text you should focus on. If you just take the frequency, those words is going to be ranked on top, but then it's going to bias your model. It's going to think that's important, but it, that actually tells you nothing because in every text you have those. So you remove things like the out of this this sequence of tokens, and then you lamentize it. Um, so what you want as your vocab is to be as um, sizable as possible so that, so that when you meet a new text, you wouldn't see a lot of unknown text, uh, unknown tokens inside that, but still, you don't want your size of vocab to be too large so that you only have one occurrence of that text. That, for that, your model would learn nothing. So in English, for instance, you have all these past tense, you have, uh, uh, multiple, like S in the end, you have different um, cases for the word. We will try to find the, the stem of the word. So you would lamentize it. In this case, that jumped, the past tense becomes the present tense, tense jump. With that, when you're doing your vocabulary, your vocabulary will become like, you will get a higher like overlapping between the words on different training sets. And then probably you will replace real words. You, want, you try to limit your vocab size so that only like things very occur very frequently are got captured. So you mask out things like uh, sneaky, for instance, if that's not happening very um, frequently. So you count your whole corpus, what's the frequency of all these words, and then you're trying to limit your vocabulary. Uh, what you see here that the sneak has a Y in the end is a way of uh, masking it out so that we're not losing all Im information. We're not taking all the real words and say this is an unknown token. We try to bucket that into things like things having a Y in the end maybe tells you a bit or two. Things have ER in the end tells you a bit or two. So you have a several different variations of unknown tokens still remaining in your corpus. But they're just masked out. So they are things all having Y in the end would all goes to the same bucket, would be replaced with that. And then that's pretty much your preprocessing. 
And then now you, what you want to do is then how do I turn this sequence of tokens into a representation like numbers so that my model can understand. And the most, most tr classical one, right, a traditional one, is a discrete representation. So one, things called one-hot encoding. Um, we generate our vocabulary, so you do your pre text preprocessing, and then you get all the unique words. This is basically the vocabulary, the things that your model knows, that this is a word, is another unknown word. And you take your text sequence, which is on top, and you say, for this word, where's the position of that? So in every column, you just have one, one, one. All the rest is zero. That's one that's called one hot. What you get out of that is a first numerical rep representation of this text, right? You have your corpus, which is this sentence, and then for each of the word, you encode it like a one hot vector. Uh, but then how do you know how this corpus is similar or different than the other corpus that you have? Say you have two sentences, and you both do this one hot encoding. It's a matrix. So then you will do bag of words representation. What you do is you take your one hot encoding, and you sum by this direction, <clears throat> by your vocabulary direction, so that in different position, if you hit the same word, then the count increase. This basically becomes that. That's your bag of words vector. And this vector represents this, corp like this text you're inputting. So it says, on is one occurrence. There's no door occurrence. Uh, I see two times gray. I see two times D, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, but note that D normally you would already strip off during when you're pre-processing it because you're removing the softwares. And what you get in Python is, in the end, like a dictionary. So you have from the word to the occurrences. Uh, you might also do indexing so that you generate your uh, vocabulary by the, the word token towards the index and just use the index to reference the count. This is the discrete representation of your text. Uh, but it also has flaws. So it wouldn't be able to understand synonyms if words are different, say a cat and a kitten, or a dog versus a hound, the re representation would be different, and it wouldn't be able to tell the difference because your model thinks it's two different vocabulary. That's why it's a discrete representation. It wouldn't be able to project the words into a continuous space and get the similarity between those. Uh, we will talk about that later, uh, but for now, this is a kind of easy, comprehensive understanding of what the composition of the text is. So you can use things like sklearn, which is not even PyTorch. You can uh, count vectorizer. It gives you that automatically. OK. So we can actually use this back of words vector and use that to predict uh, sentiments, like taking the movie reviews, we pre-process it, turn it into back of words, each of those uh, reviews, turn it into back of words representation, and use that, uh, feed through a basic PyTorch network, uh, PyTorch V4 network, and use that to say, is it a positive review or a negative review? So you have examples like those. Uh, all the inputs are this back of words representation that we talked about, right? You see in the first example, two times of good, one time of movie, one time of interesting, it's very likely that this is a positive review. And you have things like terrible or hated um, that occurs frequently, then it's likely that is a negative review. What you do, you take the back of words re representation, which is basically a sequence of numbers, and the size of that vector is always your vocab size. Each of the index, uh, the size is a vocab size, each of the index is then the count of that word within that, that text. And those numbers, you feed it through the fully connected network that we showed before, like the class. You can initiate a num different number of layers as you want. And then your output basically is still 0, 1. So you will feed it through a sigmoid activation to get the probability prediction. Or in this case, you can also get the logit because PyTorch does it for you. You count the loss, generate this 
loss scalar, loss value that based on zero and one versus the, the prediction um, probability. And then you do back, backward um, back propagation with it. And that's your first text classifier. So let's see how you do it exactly. All right, so um, you can open up Collab and then load this first uh, notebook into it. I won't run it on the fly, but I've already generated all the outputs for you. So these are just the packages you need. You see like NN, functional, et cetera. So these are the preparations for it. Um, basically, you download the text, and then that's how the text looks like uh, as your raw data. So you have one column, which is basically the reviews. It's full of text. And then you have the label 0 and 1. What we try to do, we take this, we try to take this, and then do a back of words representation for each of the records. So that's how you do in PyTorch. Uh, you initially your data set class. Uh, you're reading your data. You do count vectorizer on it. That's from sklearn, so that turns it already into the back of words. And then it generates, this is basically your vocabulary. And then the reverse vocabulary, which is basically from, uh, from index to token and from token to index. Yeah. And your sequences is basically what your training data is. So in the end, that's this back of words um, representation. And your labels is the target that you want to predict to. So ideally, your prediction is very close, is almost the same as this 0, 1 target. And then, of course, you need to write these two functions that to either index by the item, uh, get the item by, by the index, or get the size by length. So then I just load it in. And we can see a few examples of that. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, you can interrupt any time when you're running the notebook if there's any problem or confusions around that. So that's how our model would want, right? We want a very simple feed-forward network where the input is our bag of words and then to predict the class. That's the map. Yeah. All right. So that's what, what is wrote over here is what this graph is. So we take our input, we do some matrix multiplication, we do activation, and we do a few of those until we hit the output. Yeah? And we might wrap it in, into this, this thing, which is a sigmoid that, gives, that scales your output into between 0 and 1. And we use that as the property for the prediction. And we define the loss. And then you, use, you call your optimizer saying, please step. Uh, we do backward propagation. And then we call our optimizer saying, please take a step of the, all the parameters so that we're going downhills. And over here, this is how you define your uh, neural net, uh, same as what I showed before. So you initialize it. You give it a few parameters, uh, the size of my vocabulary, and then also each of the layers, how many uh, neurons I want it to have. Uh, you always give it a, a number like by power of 2, uh, 512. Uh, 256, et cetera, um, it actually give, it's actually more optimized in this way. And when you're calling the model, PyTorch will tell, will tell you what kind of like model structure you have. Over here, we have a very simple model that we have a vocabulary of 3,000. And then we try to project that to a, a size of 128, and then further down on the second layer until on the output layer, we want to predict 1 or 0. OK, and this is also you see before. We initialize it with what's called a binary cross entropy. So it's, a, it's also built in. You can also use cross entropy, which uh, automatically says, assumes it's multi class. But in this case, since we only have one and zero, I use binary, uh, binary cross entropy. 
and then you call your optimizer. In this case, it's a dynamic one called Adam, so it's gonna know by this, uh, it's gonna dynamically change your learning rate so that when you're taking a step, you're not overcrossing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I noticed that you're using this comprehension to exclude uh, stuff that's essentially only mm -hmm. have things that require gradient. Yeah. Does model parameters have to automatically do this? Is that like a, is it required in PyTorch that you remove certain parameters? Because I would assume that, if I would, that the optimizer might be able to detect that, right? Or is that, would that be a wrong assumption? Um, yeah, this is just a standard this way is, to yeah. always do it. it. So, I would say that if you call by parameters, it will only returns you all the variables that is trainable, so it would work. Uh, but it's like a standard way of doing that, so that you make sure that none of those um, static values got feed into it and got changed. So if you have an embedding layer and you freeze that layer, so you don't want to do any training on it, I'm pretty sure it will still appear in that model about parameters. Oh yeah, true. Yeah. Oh yeah. uh, right. So, yeah. so, so this is a good habit to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they're giving a learning rate of uh, initial learning rate, uh, but it will adapt it to it each round it runs. Okay. Then you call model.train, which basically just tells your model that you're in a training mode. And over here, you can run inside it. So we specifically do only 10 rounds, and it's quite a small data set. So when you run it, it doesn't take seconds to get the output. Yeah. Uh, we, we train it for 10 rounds, and each of those loaders will give me a batch of size of uh, 512. So is that right? Yeah, anyway, it gives, gives me back the first batch, batch by batch. So for each of those batches, I then do the same thing. That's basically one round over the, over the model. I said zero out my gradients on the parameters. I give it a forward pass, so that I generate my prediction. I use the prediction versus the target, and get the loss, and then this is basically the, the, the loss number, uh, and use that number to do uh, differentiation backwards. <laughs> and then you take a step to, towards the right direction, and then uh, this is basically just recording how our loss goes down throughout each round. Over here you see the output. So it starts from 0.7 and goes down. Okay. Um, yeah, we can see a few examples. So here we give it a text and then we, like, we tokenize that text. So we do pre-processing over here by the, this thing. So that it turns it into a bag of words. And then we use that to say, please give me a prediction output. And uh, giving the output and which is uh, feed into the sigmoid to get the prediction. And then let's see, like if we say like it's more than 50% that it says is a, a positive, then we print positive, otherwise negative. Yeah. Let's see a few examples. So for instance here is this poor excuse for a movie is terrible, et cetera, is very likely is a negative review. And the output of it, that's um, the sigmoid. And then the other one, uh, Cool Cat Save the Kid is a symbolic masterpiece, right? And, uh, and it might, must be like interesting, intriguing, or these kind of words. And then there's a positive sentiment. Yeah. So there's a few examples. You can write your own as well, give it a text, and then try to use this, this method to get the prediction. Yeah, that's pretty much it, basic intro. And then, yeah, so then it's gonna talk about continuous representations. Right now we have a discrete one, but then how do you know the synonyms be between words? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so a big thing that made deep learning for NLP possible was this idea of the embedding. Um, so before with NLP, words were always treated categorically like with this one hot representation or something like that. Um, but we really want it to be that we have like a similar representation if there's a similar meaning. Um, we want to be able to have this property. Um, so we can come up with this idea of the embedding where we have for every word, 
we have this uh, vector, so you look downwards per word, and there's this some kind of representation. And we would hope that with whatever representation we come up with, that we can have properties that synonyms would have a similar vector representation. So you can see kind of like right here, the words on and the both have relatively similar vectors. So that's what we want. Um, so this is also how you can create an embedding layer in PyTorch. So you can basically have PyTorch just learn embeddings on the fly while you're training. Uh, but let's go into how we can train these embeddings ourselves or how, how people train them. So word to vec, I won't go into the details of the algorithm, but I'll go over the high level concept of what it is. So we kind of have this assumption with word to vec where we have words that are similar in location will have some kind of similar meaning. And if we get enough text, we can imagine that we can get this really good representation of words based on its neighbors. Uh, so the basic idea is that there's a neural network that's trained and it's going to predict a target word given some kind of context word. So if we imagine we just pick a random word in here, then we pick another random word within maybe X neighbors that we can have say that these two are a training example for these two words have some kind of meaning connection. Um, so it's called the skip gram model. Um, and there's also the first quote that you should know a word by the company it keeps. So that's like the idea of the context giving away the meaning. <laughs> Um, so the traditional vector uh, pre-trained embeddings that people will use for these NLP models is GLOVE. So this is from Stanford. Um, this is one of the pictures from their paper. Uh, so this really cool thing with what they did with this word to vec is that they're able to create these uh, representations for every word and they actually have a semantic meaning behind them. So of course the vectors they train are either like 50 dimensional or 100 dimensional or 300 dimensional. You can, there's an algorithm called TSNE, which will take these high dimensional representations and plot them into 2D by an approximation algorithm. So we can see that we have these words plotted here, and we can even see that they have some kind of semantic geometry to them. So for example, we can take the word king, subtract man, and plus woman, and that's gonna approximately equal queen. Um, so these, with these kind of metaphors, is that's how we can know that the algorithm is working correctly. So you can see on the bottom right you see king, and then on the bottom left you see man, and then you see woman on top left, and then if you do the vector operation, you can get queen. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so there's also a way we can visualize these glove embeddings. So there's this really cool repo um, with this user. Um, it might be hard to see from here. We can basically, um, so what they did was they took these high dimensional word embeddings and they decided that they wanted to um, plot them in a 3D way. So you can kind of like zoom around and these are all from GloVe. Um, so if we stop here, oh gosh. Oh, there it is, okay, sorry. Yeah, it might be, might be too hard to see. But you can kind of see each of these nodes will have a word associated with them. Yeah, I think nobody can read that. But on your own time, you can look at that. It's super cool. You can see like words like mother, father, sister, brother will all be in their own little cluster. Countries in Africa will all be in their own little cluster also. You'll have whatever kind of topic, you'll be able to see where it fits in this 3D space. And it's really cool to have this visualization of how the embeddings work. Okay. Uh, okay. So there's also an uh, embeddings notebook that you can check out. Uh, I won't go as in detail with the other one, uh, but basically a cool takeaway from this one is how can we load these blood vectors easily? Um, so traditionally, I commented out, people would like grab this file name from the Stanford page. They would open up the file name and like split each line. Uh, that's a little bit tedious. So what we can use is we can use this uh, library in Python called Magnitude which will load them in an efficient way, uh, called Pi Magnitude. Um, you can download this file in two seconds, at least on my internet speed, and it would then take very long, and you can query a list of words and then get the glove vectors nice and easy. Um, a cool thing also is that we can do these vector operations on the word, so if we define a cosine similarity function and we get the glove vectors for each of the two, of the two words that we want to compare, um, we can actually get the cosine similarity, so we can just get some random words like dog and cat and see they have a high similarity. 
and then like tree and cat lower, you know, and king and queen higher. So you can kind of do these kind of similarities between two words. Um, and then also I show here we have the T S N E plot. So I just thought up of two categories of things. I thought up of animals and of household objects, and I just listed them. Whoops, listed them all out here. So I just on the top of my head. Uh, and then we can use the T S N E algorithm uh, to be able to then plot these in two dimensions. And you can see that there's a very clear difference. So the, the TSNE algorithm has no idea what's, a, what's an animal or what's a household object. All it sees are these vectors of numbers. And it's able to plot them in such a way that there's a very clear distinction in the way these vectors are formed that separate them. So that's the general idea. Um, yeah. OK, so now let's talk about RNNs. So, when you think about what a sequence is, so we could just think of like weather patterns. So it might be sunny two days and rain, and then we have sun and rain. Music is also a sequence where we have something and then the next note is predicted from the previous note. And text is, of course, also a sequence. Um, so the thing that is in common is that they all have some kind of time axis. So it's some kind of pattern or some kind of distribution that evolves over time. Uh, so these appear everywhere. Um, yeah, so neural networks up to this point don't, didn't really have a good way of handling sequences like this because it would all just look at like everything together. It wouldn't be able to have this kind of idea of what came before and what's going to come after. So when we get a recurrent neural network, we have this, basically it has a loop that feeds into itself. So at every time step, the network feeds some kind of state back into itself. So we can look at the basics of RNN. So we can basically take this, which is, uh, representation and unfold it per time. So if we unfold it per time, we can see we have for every input x, we can see that's input here. So it's like for every input x, we give it to the <coughs> recurrent neural network at a time step and it passes a hidden state onto the next. So it's able to maintain these. So there's input, hidden state, and then these are some, some output. So yeah, at each time step, the RNN unit uses the previous hidden state and the input at that time step to predict a new hidden state and also an output. So the general function of how we describe this is that h sub t is the hidden state. We have some kind of function that takes in the previous hidden state and also our x sub t, our input. And this is parameterized by theta, so it has kind of weights to it as well. Uh, so we have also different types of RNNs. So we can have, OK, so one to one, this is just like no RNN. This is just like a um, classic neural network like a feed for a network for image classification. Uh, we can have a one to many. So this is where you have like one input image and then we generate some kind of caption to that. So it's one to many. So uh, these blue on here are like every output. We can have many to one where we take a movie review, which is like several words, and then we have one output. Like is it a positive review or is it a negative review? Then we can have many to many. So this is like machine translation, text generation, so we have like an input, like a uh, translation in English, or we have English and then we translate it to German, for example. And then we have many to many, so you can also have video classification on any frame level. Uh, so we have a, something that's called the vanishing gradient problem. So with traditional RNAs, is, traditional RNAs had a really hard time managing these long-term dependencies. What it would do is it would forget things really quickly. Like over like four time steps, it would forget something. It had a really hard time with that. Um, so we can imagine when we do the back propagation, every one of these we have a gradient being multiplied, right? And because of the chain rule, so if we have some gradient early on that has like a value of like less than one, this is going to get multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. It's going to get really tiny. Um, so this is called the vanishing gradient. So the effect of this for RNN is that words that appear really far back are going to have a, like a negligible Im impact on later on if they had a small gradient. Uh, so this is really bad. So like you can imagine, you can say something like, Harry, my best friend and classmate from my childhood back in Oklahoma is here. So we ask our network, okay, tell us who is here. And they're going to say Oklahoma because that was like right before. So the RNN is not able to really comprehend like these kind of something that's really long back that we need to take into account for answering our question. 
Uh, another problem is this exploding gradient. So this is vanishing. We have exploding. So it's, it's similar. It's just the instead of our uh, being less than one, our gradients being less than one, we have it be larger than one for early time steps. And it's going to get multiplied, and multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. It's going to get really huge. Uh, so one possible remedy is you can do gradient clipping. So you can say, I want the max or min value of my gradient to be these certain values, and it's going to like cap it out. Uh, but there's still this fundamental problem with RNNs is that they have a really hard time handling these long-term dependencies. So this is going to motivate the discussion of different RNN architectures. So this is our simple RNN that we just kind of talked about a bit. So it's, it's pretty, uh, yeah, so it's simple. Then there's an LSTM, uh, which you probably have heard of. Uh, so it kind of solves this gradient problem by remembering things. So it has these certain gates that help it remember. And then we also have a GRU, which happened after the LSTM, which was um, basically a simplification of the LSTM by having less operations that made it train faster without suffering too much performance loss. Okay, so the symbol RNN is with this equation. So it's really just we take a previous hidden state, we take the tan uh, x, x of t, our uh, input. Uh, we do, we have weights, and we just do dot product and add them together, apply a tan h to normalize them between negative one and one, and then, then we, that's how we get our new hidden state. Uh, okay, so you'll actually see this on the next slide, so I want to discuss it. If you see this notation with the little circle, this, just, this is just like an element-wise product, so the fancy name is, is Hadamard product, but it looks like this. So it's, it's just, it's the way matrix multiplication, you might think it works at the beginning of your math class. Uh, okay, so with LSTM, it gets a bit more complicated with the implementation. We'll go through each part. Okay, so C is our cell state. H is our hidden state. X is our input. And then we have our next hidden state. We have our next uh, cell state. Okay, so this first one in the cyan, we have our previous cell state. So this is basically like a fast, a fast lane. So because RNNs had a hard time uh, taking what's previous and taking old memories and pulling them to the beginning or to the current prediction, uh, this kind of provides like a fast lane for the LSTM to transfer information. So we have different operations that will contribute to this fast lane. So this fast lane, basically it only has a multiplication or an addition. So it has either stuff zeroing out or added to it. So it's, it can help with uh, maintaining old memories better. So this gate right here is called the forget gate. So this one is this F sub T. So yeah, so the picture here corresponds with the equations here. So they're, they're equivalent, but it it's, can be easier for some people to see one and other people to see the other. Uh, so with the forget gate here, the main idea between this forget gate is that it will make it so that this is a sigmoid here. A sigmoid scales it between zero and one. Oh yeah, so, sorry. So each of these ones in green is its own neural network. So each of these is like a little mini neural network. They're each parameterized by weights. So you see W sub F, U sub F are both parameters of this neural network here. And W sub I, U sub I is what, what's here. So these, these are each parameterized by weights. So what the, this one does is it tells our network whether we want to forget something or not. So it's gonna output with a sigmoid zero or sub between zero and one. So one is like let's remember everything, zero is like let's forget this thing. So an example of where this is useful is like if we're talking about like um, if we're like having a model that's trying to like predict like the gender of someone with like their name, then we might say when we get a new name, let's forget the gender pronoun that we were using before to like start over for this new person, for example. So that would be a really nice use for this forget gate here. Next, uh, let's talk about is the update gate. So that's right here. Uh, so what this basically does is it will take our previous hidden state and it will apply a sigma and it will say which parts of our previous hidden state do we want to like focus on, I guess. We also have a tan h, so this takes it, so this basically just scales our hidden state. So this is like the input and this is like what we want to remember of our input. And then we add these to our uh, fast lane for our cell state. And then we also have this output gate, which is this the O sub T here. Um, and this is basically how we want to compute our next hidden state. 
Okay, so this is all pretty complicated, but the overall idea is that these LSTMs are pretty good at remembering stuff that happened long ago, much better than simple RNN. Uh, so a nice simple, so something you might wonder is why do we need to have like this cell state and also this hidden state? Like, because they're both kind of doing similar kind of things. They're both taking the previous output and then like predicting something new. So that was, the GRU actually doesn't have this cell state. So they simplified it by just having this hidden state and they modify this hidden state. So it's similar, it's just like a s simplification. So this is the update gate. So they actually, for this LCM, they had this forget and update, but they both kind of do similar things. So one's like, let's forget these things. The other one's like, let's remember these things. So that's not super nice, because they're both kind of doing like the same thing. So let's have one update gate right here. And then we also have a reset gate. So the update gate tells us what we want to remember or forget. And then the reset gate, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, this one's the reset gate. But yeah, um, so the overall, this is just a simplification of it. So. The nice thing about here is the previous LSTM has a lot more operations. You can see there's like a lot more stuff going on here if you count them. And this has a lot less. So the effect of this is that this is a lot quicker for training. And with, they found that there's a similar performance. OK, so let's talk about the PyTorch RNN, how we describe our model for defining our RNN. So we first take our class, and we inherit from NN.module like before. And we must define an init and a forward. And then for our init, we also had to inherit from the parent class. We define an embedding layer as our encoder. We define an RNN as our GRU. And we also define a decoder, which will take the output of the GRU shape and project it onto the shape of our target. So if we're doing like classification, we'll want one. If we want to uh, distinguish between three classes, we'll put three. And then we define forward. So forward's like how we want to take our inputs that were given to us and then make retransform the do some transformations to make them into our output. So we first apply an encoder on our input. We get encoded. We get an RNN. So this takes in the input in a previous hidden state. Uh, so to get that hidden state, we actually call up here outside this model definition init hidden, and then we'll get this hidden state, and that's the stuff that is right here. Then for our output, we apply a decoder. And then we return an output in the hidden state. And we basically call this in a loop for a per item in our input. OK. Uh, so let's look at a sentiment text classification example. Uh, oh, I don't want to open up. Oh, yeah, it's a link. My bad. Yeah. OK, yeah, sorry. Let's open this one up. Yeah, so this is an RNN to do. So before we were doing a bag of words to do our text classification, so that it was not taking into account position of the words at all. And that for this one, we'll do an RNN. So for example, for one way that this could do better is if you say, like, um, not good, you know, you need the position to know that what that means. Like, you need to know that not appears before good. Um, if it was in a different ordering, you know, or if it was unordered, it might have a different connotation. Uh, okay, like if it said not good versus not bad, you know, it's it's hard to if it ba you have a bag of words, you can't distinguish those as well. Um, yeah, so basic idea: we'll use a GRU here, and we define an RNN. So this RNN has an encoder with our embedding layer. We def we niche define a GRU here, and then we have a decoder. So it's very similar to the code snippet you saw. Um, yeah, so it's doing, so instead of actually taking in the hidden state, it takes in the entire, so instead of taking one input at a time in a for loop, it will take all the inputs together and then apply them all together to the RNN. So it will, this will do like this passing of the hidden state like under the hood instead of like explicitly doing it. Uh, yeah, so we have our inputs, we have an encoder, we have a GRU, decoder, we'll get log, logits, logits back, I guess. Um, and then the lo logits and the target, you can compare them with your criteria, which is your loss function, which will tell you how your model is doing. And then you get loss to then perform gradient descent on. So we instantiate uh, BCE with lo logits loss, which will do a binary cross entropy. And then optimizer you define with Adam. And then similar to before, we just have another training loop. It's, it's actually, I think, nearly identical to the one before. Um, yeah, but we get we see the 
model has learned something, and then we can see it similar to before, like give either negative sentiment or positive sentiment to these different reviews. Okay. Uh, so the next notebook we're gonna look at is for character generation. So we wanna look at like given some input characters, we can also have our targets as like one time step off. So for every like Q, we'll predict U, U will predict I, C, you know, so we do this like one off setup. So we can look at this model to help understand what's happening. Uh, so we take our, yeah, we take our input and we take our hidden. Okay, yeah, I see. So yeah, so it's basically for every time step of the input, we'll apply the GRU to it and we'll pass the hidden to itself. Okay, so let's open this. Uh, it's just the time step. So you always want to give the previous one the next one. You could do it also so you have it like the, um, yeah, okay, so it's, it's a teacher forcing. So you want to always have the previous one, predict the next one. That, that's a, yeah, sorry. That's probably this language model concept. So basically, we'll try to train a model that if I said I am, and it's gonna predict the next word. So I'm using my word, so you can use a very long text like novel or somehow, and then you always shuffle it by windows. So you give a few words, predict the next one, and then shuffle the, um, like move your window a bit, and then you train like this. That's what a language model is, and it's, um, yeah. yeah. But we just do it on character level, character by character. Okay. So this is text preprocessing, where you have our data set class, we get load our data, we get a vocab size, we make something that will turn characters into indices and the indices back to characters. Um, yeah, so we, and then we turn them into it. So we have, for every input, we'll have the list of integers that describe its position in the dictionary. So we have an RNM model here. So we'll take our, yeah, so it, I guess it is very similar to the one before. So this one, we actually do carry the hidden here. So instead of passing like, all the inputs at once and then having one target, we said do it so that we give it one character, and then we give it then a, yes, yeah, so we give it one character, we get the hidden state, and then we calculate the loss per character. So we keep feeding like the correct answer back to the model instead of letting the model like carry its own state. Uh, so that we can see this in the training loop. So for input targets in our batch, so for every character in our input, we will apply our we'll, we will apply the model to that one character, and then we'll have our model actually apply the criterion on that one output that it predicted versus that correct character output. So that's why there's like this one off here. Yeah. So in this training loop, and then so the results aren't going to look amazing because it was just like a really simple model, but you can see so this is for generating weight loss articles. Um, but you can see that it's, it's generated during like English looking text that sounds about like weight loss, you know. Um, so we'll actually do a text generation after this that will be considerably better, but this is the simple model that's easier to understand. Yep. In the training loop, it's kind of curious, you don't want to do like early stopping or something, um, because you have to set things to train a little bit, so you drop the, uh, something else. Um, how, how do you get the validation? Uh, if you do dropout or what? Well, my understanding is you have to set parameters to train a little before you do the training loop, right? Mm -hmm. So you do this model dot train. Yeah. So I, I guess my question is, my understanding is, you have to then test the model. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sort of you do model dot eval, and that will like turn off your dropout and everything. You do that in the loop. Basically, if you want to get to get the first stop, you need to get validation model. Just curious how you actually do that. Yeah. So if you were doing in this loop, if you were doing both a training step and then also a validation step. Uh, what I usually do is have separate functions, one train and then one, another one for validate, and at the train one, I'll have a model.train, and the validate one, I'll have a model.eval, and then it'll make it so that the drop, so for the evaluation mode, it'll turn off the dropouts and everything. Okay, so you just run one after the other. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I didn't show it here for simplicity, but yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so th this just generated some, not, not passable text, but it, it's, it's, doing, it's doing its job. And then we'll later do better text generation. And now Jeff, you're going to talk about sequence modeling. Yeah. Cool. So, short recap <clears throat> we see bag of words, which is a 
discrete representation, just like what's the composition of words within this text. Then we say we don't know synonyms, and we talk about embeddings, which basically um, projects the meaning of the word uh, by taking into account of its context. Where does it normally show up? And then we found out that, OK, we can use this embeddings to, to into the RNNs that you just see. And then we can also um, create meaningful vectors for the whole text. So we're feeding a, a, a sentence, and then the hidden layer is going to accumulate uh, what's the previous word it takes. So this representation versus the back of words. Back of words doesn't take into account of the position of the, the words, right? So it just takes, say, uh, D occurs three times and so on. RNN that does take into account. So if you take the last hidden state, it actually con um, contains all the, the ordering meanings of the previous word, plus that you have feeding the embedding. So it takes into account the meaning of the word plus the positions. And we use that for language modeling, basically predicting the next word or next character, et cetera. But we can also produce something called, like sequence models that's more useful, for instance, like translations, where you take it a sequence of English uh, text, and can you uh, turn those representation into a vector that can use that to emit uh, translation for like French or German? Yeah, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So uh, the most simple one out of the sequence models is where we sequence to sequence. So our input is a sequence of text, uh, say English, and then we feed that into encoder. You can imagine that like a simple RNN or a GRU. So by each step, it, it reads in the, the new word as a new input construct the next hidden state with the previous hidden state together, and it goes on until it can turn the whole input uh, sequence into this context vector you see here. And then this, this pass on to the decoder, where the decoder takes position by position. So say, this is my input context, which conveys all the sequence of information of the source. Can I generate a target one step by a time? that actually represents as the, the translation, as the output. So here is an English to German translation. <clears throat> and both of these encoder and decoder can be recursive neural nets. So you can do two RNNs. One reads in the input, one spits out the output. Okay, uh, we can look at some different applications of sequence to sequence. So, Machine translation is one from one kind of text to the other language. You can do question answering with chatbot. Someone asks a question, someone answers, that the model answers. You can do date formatting. Um, or you can do also speech to text. So speech is also like an audio format. You can cut it into small chunks and then use that as timestamps and then use that to predict what's the text for each of those chunks or a few chunks. <clears throat> and what we do at uh, Scalpy, uh, we do name to domain. For instance, we sometimes see on the websites their company name. We use NER to extract those company names. Uh, but for us, it's very important to know the website of the company. So can we use the input sequence of those names to predict what its website is, to predict its domain as both sequences? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I see the examples here. Uh, for the first one is translation from English to German. The other one's QA, like how are you, I'm fine. And the other one is date formatting. So you, uh, if you have a data set that contains a lot of like hand, um, not handwritten, like free text, like dates, it can come with different kind of format, like this, 12th of July, 2019, or different formats. Can we all normalize it into a sequence output of that? Or in our case, a, a name to domain, given a name of the, uh, website, can we predict actually their URL or the domain of the website? So it's actually quite useful if you train it well and then it's gonna do good predictions on that. So here's an animation, uh, which from some of that source, uh, there's all these blogs about great animations that you can really <laughs> understand well with a, a few five, 10 minutes. So <clears throat> at each time step, from the input, it feeds into the encoder. 
imagine the RNN that we talked about before. So say your French, uh, French input from the first word inputs it, it emits the hidden state. And your RNN goes on. The second input with the previous hidden state generates a new hidden state, etc. What you do is you take the last hidden state, which you assume contains all the information from the previous tokens. You give that to the decoder, and then decoder takes it time seven by time seven, uh, considering its new input from the previous word, and then your context to generate this translation. Yep. That's basically how it works. And then you can think about it both as R and N, and how the model will connect together. We'll show in a sec. Yeah, this is also another animation more in detail. See, like from hidden one to hidden two to hidden three, and that's our output, the last hidden state, and use that to emit the next translation, the next word for the translation. <coughs> Okay, on top we want to add something called attention, yeah? And this attention mechanism actually boosts this model uh, quite a lot. So if you have a plain, let's say LSTM for your encoder and then LSTM for your decoder, although LSTM compared to RNN captures long-term <coughs> dependencies much better, but you only feed the last input, like the last hidden state to the if you go back, we only feed the last hidden state into the decoder. And in RNN state, like in your last state, that means the, the words that's most recent is actually most important. So some of the techniques they try is like bi-directional, they read the text from this side versus like both directional and try to feed those contexts into it. Um, but still, both sides, like the, the start and the end got captured the most. So it doesn't actually tell you if I'm on this position of the decoder, which of the word is the most important, this alignment, right? From my input, I am Jeffrey, and like to a, to a German input, if I'm on M, which, am I on the second timestamp, which word should I focus most from my input state? And that's what the idea of attention is. So there's two differences from attention to what are a simple sequence to sequence with uh, RNNs or LSTMs. First, that instead of just feeding the last hidden state, we take all the hidden states from the source. So all the sequence hidden state outputs, we all feed into the decoder. And then secondly, the decoder, at each time stamp when it's gonna predict, it's gonna look at all these previous contexts, like these are the single vectors that on each of the time step, and you say which one of that is the most important. And in the end, this is actually an alignment problem, right? I take my output sequence, my position, and I look at all these previous input timestamp and, and say which input is the most important for me right now to, to make the next prediction. And that's the idea of attention. And yeah, here we have a more detail. Um, don't worry how to... <laughs> the weights are actually calculated. But, and your encoder stage is exactly the same as um, the sequence to sequence or a simple RNN. At each time step, you have this output. So say our input is three words. Um, um, this is, uh, I love PyTorch, for instance, yeah? I love PyTorch, each represented as this hidden state, H1, H2, and H3. And then your encoder at each step, it takes its output, like the previous output, I just said, token n, it embeds it, it gets the new hidden state of that RNN, and then you use that, so that's actually your previous word representation and your target. You take your target, and then you compare that to all the hidden state. What is it? Oh yeah, hey. Yeah, so it goes on until it says, that the most likely next word is the end token. So when you're training it, you give it a start token, and you, you pad it with the end token, so that when you're training it, it knows, okay, this is my start, that's my end. So at which length is most likely that has to end? 
uh, in reality, when we're tra training it, we also give it like a, a maximum length. So we said that this model is not going to go on forever if it's like go out of state or somehow. Yeah. Um, so you see over here, that's what it does at this step. So it takes this hidden state from the decoder, like the current, the previous target words uh, representation. It compares with all the previous hidden state and does a scoring. It used the score to say which are the ones that is most important. So that's the one you, you that's the one you use for weighting this coloring. The lighter it is, the more emphasis is the song. So you scale your input into different. Uh, you scale your input basically of all these vectors, and then you sum it so that your context vector right now at each time step of the decoder is going to look different. Because your encoder is always the same. Like your encoder gives you the same input. But then for each step of your decoder, it should gives you a different emphasis on which one. So actually, it does the scoring, adds on top, and then use that to predict the next word. So we feed that together with the hidden state through a feed-forward network with 10H, scale it, and then the output is basically a softmax. Yeah. Um, so the, on your output layer, you project your uh, hidden size of this, two times the hidden size, which they together. You project that to the vocabulary space, and you do a softmax, which one of the next word is most likely. And that's on one step, and then you can do a second step. The second step basically takes, a, takes into account of the previous hidden state here. And then at this step, it compares out of all the known uh, context vectors, which one are the most important at this position? Guess again, it spits out the next one. That's the overall idea. So why is it performing much better? It is basically it actually gets all the context from the input, that's one thing. And also at each step, it's able to focus on different part of the, the context that's most relevant for next prediction. And Those are the so-called encoder decoder intentionists. Um, you can think about an, uh, attention here as an alignment uh, task. Yeah, I take my decoder current time step. I compare to all the encoders and tell me which part should I pay attention to. Yeah, so attention determines which part of the input input sequence is most important for my time step at decoder. That's why it's called encoder-decoder intention, because it compares the encoder sequence versus the decoder sequence. So over here, you have the encoder sequence, all of those, and then you have one decoder sequence. It tries to come up with a score, and then you feed it into overall, this is the softmax of, the, of, of this rule. So it says, out of all these inputs from the encoder on this, this timestamp, what's the one that's most important? So for instance, from English to French, English is our input. And then the first time step, it says D is the most important. And this is actually from the original paper that, that, um, that does that. Um, they give a boost on the boost score of translations. Uh, this, this matrix is what you see here of uh, alpha TS. This is actually the attention weight. Um, so, so each of the cell is scaled by the softmax to between 0 and 1, and if you sum this, it should be equal to, to 1 over here, if you sum by the rows. <clears throat> and, it, and actually, when you look at the plot, you can see how the alignment goes, right? So it's not necessary that each timestamp, like timestamp 3, I correspond to timestamp of encoder. It actually learns it by itself. It says maybe your language ordering is different between two languages. So when I'm, when I'm here, European, that correspond to here in European with a different, uh, different position, but actually give it a big boost. So it says this token or this context from the encoder is very important, important on this time set. That's why it gives a very accurate output of, on this position of the decoder. So you take your weight and you scale by your input by this weight and then you sum it. This is what we see before of the um, that you have scaled by different colors, and then you sum that into this context vector. 
And that's the context vector specifically at this time. So that's why you see CT of the decoder, and you use that to generate attention, which gives you a prediction in the end. That's how the, the cell works. Okay, that's how you do it in PyTorch. Um, so at the previous slide, you see the score before you do the weight, the score. Uh, there's different kind of method you can do scoring for that. Um, you can do some matrix multiplication between the decoder and encoder, um, et cetera. Uh, there are different ones. You can see the, the family of those here. Uh, we're using the most original one from the paper where you actually transform both the encoder input and the current decoder hidden state, and then you concatenate them and then scale by them, scale by 10H, which is a, a score that tells you how much they are aligned. And I use that to feed into a softmax to scale them between zero and one. That gives a um, distribution among the different input context. And then use that to scale your encoder output, which is basically your different uh, encoder position context into the real context vector at this stage you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's how you do attention with sequence to sequence. Um, in, in PyTorch, uh, but a few researchers at Google, they found out that actually re attention is what matters, right? So your sequence to sequence, although it, it gives you these different positions at each time step, but with attention, you're able to say, what are all the alignments between the input and output sequence? For each of the output, it actually looks at all the input and say, what's the most important? So. Uh, that's why this paper comes out. Attention is what you, uh, what you need, uh, what is all you need. Uh, it comes from one and a half years ago. Uh, it's one that really changes the game of NLP. Um, what they said is that we can use a lot of attentions. We just use attentions to align on the input text, among the, even among the words. And if we do that, we, if we stack all these encoder-decoder uh, we, if we stack all these like attentions together, it's going to become a, an encoder, and I can also stack all these attentions together, that becomes a decoder. Can I just use that in, and get rid of RNs at all? Right? I stack a lot of those attentions, which actually tells me all the alignments between texts. And one, one thing, one of the good things is that super parallelizable, because you have all these um, attentions, which you can train on each of those uh, separate GPUs, and uh, also they initiate something called a multi-head, which is basically uh, initialize, initializing a lot of different um, attentions. Each of those attentions, you think about it like an ensemble model, uh, where you, each of those, uh, one of the ensemble's attentions is able to learn the alignments within its own text. And it's like, what they said is much faster to train. In reality, they did it in a very beefy machine on a very beefy model, uh, and that's what generated all these um, coming forward, like uh, open AIs, trans the transformer model, et cetera. Those are like extremely large machines, uh, extremely large models, but they're very useful for transfer learning, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's go a bit into the detail of how transformers work. In the end, it's a stack of encoder and decoder, similar, yeah? The only thing changes is that each of those encoders does, is not an RNA anymore. They're just, a, they're just all these things called self-attention. They're attention cells. You stack all these together, that actually, what it does is it creates an alignment between its own text. So my input text, say it's an English text, like, I love PyTorch. At each of the steps, it actually aligns within itself. Like, I, which word it correspond to, most likely, within my input text, in a second position, a third position, et cetera. That's what, that's what it does inside the encoder step. And then the decoder step, it does similar things. It takes the target output, it feeds it through uh, the attention, and then plus the, the attention output from the encoder, and then code determines which kind of output should I generate for each of those positions. So it does similarly, encoder decoder fashion. Uh, English to German. 
Yeah. What it, what it actually looks like is inside each of those encoder and each of those decoder is two parts. One is something called self-alignment. This is what you take the same sentence and you say of each of the position, each of those word positions, which of the other words that it most relates to. You take that representation, you feed it through a normal feed forward network, and then you and then you stack them up, right? Like in the previous slide, we see a stack of encoders together and then a stack of decoder. Imagine you just have one, then you have a representation of the encoder, and then you send it to the encoder decoder attention. And then here you have the decoder self attention, which is the representation of your decoder step. Together, this encoder decoder attention, similar to the attention we talked about before, takes those both input and then predict the next word. Okay? Okay, cool. So that's how the equation looks like. In reality, um, you take your input and then you generate something called a query, a key, and a value, yeah? It, and why is it called self-attention? It's because your query and your key is actually the same same sentence, same sequence. In the previous like decoder encoder, you take your probably your key, then is your decoder sequence, and then uh, sorry, your query is your decoder sentence, and then your key is your encoder sentence, and you try to align decoder with the encoder. With self attention is actually looking at the same se sequence and said, my query is myself at this timestamp, my key is all the um, inputs, context of uh, of the same same sentence. And which of those is the most important? So it does this dot product of the transpose, and then it scales by the value to generate this. So this is actually your, uh, you can think about it like your encoder representation out of the self attention, or also decoder works. If you take the same sentence and you just want to know which of the words we think that correspond to the other. And what they do is they do a multi head, which is basically each of those layers is one attention and then generate multiple um, ones of those that um, act like an ensemble kind of method. Um, that allows the model to learn actually different uh, alignments between its own self-attention. So yeah, I'm not gonna go much into detail, and that's all the overall model looks like from the paper. And then let's, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna skip, skip through these two slides. Um, you can look at it later, but let's see how it actually works. So over here we have a easier one. So transformer is like a lot of ensembles which doesn't train like scale well right now here. Um, so over here what we show is a sequence to sequence model with attention, this one I showed before. So the attention is basically an encoder decoder attention. Okay, how you prepare the data is in similar fashion. You inherit by the data set uh, and you pad it. This is where you want to pad the sequences so that it's all in the same length. That's the start of the token, end of the uh, start of the sequence, end of the sequence token, and for unknown words. So you pre-process your text into those tokens, remove the weird words, and then you generate those sequence of um, uh, indices, which represents your input and output sequences. And then, oops. generator, oh yeah. And then here is our model definition. So a similar diagram before, but what you would do is you, you initiate an encoder for it, which basically takes the embedding. Embedding is your input word into the embedding, feeds it into the a RNN, or in this case, it's a GRU. And when you do the forward pass, it takes the, the previous hidden state and spits out the next, um, it's the plain RNN. Then you define another decoder, uh, which in this case, similar in the first part, which is the GRU, like the, the recurrent neural net, taking into the account of the, the embeddings from the decoder, and then feed it through attention weights. And, your, and when you do the forward pass, it takes both the encoder output with the current hidden state output from, from the GRU, and then try to scale to get the score. And use that score to to scale your attention weights and use that to predict the output. 
Yeah, that's the two class, encoder and decoder, and then you pass it on together, so you, you initiate a new model saying, it's an encoder decoder within that you call your encoder, you call your decoder, and on each of the forward path, you, each of those four, forward paths for is here. When you call the model, it feeds the data into encoder, uh, generate the hidden, hidden context, which is basically your um, context at that timestamp, and then takes the uh, decoder hidden state together with that to generate the next, next word prediction. Yep, and then you can do training similar in similar fashion. You initiate your model, you do exactly the same thing here. And then here are a few examples that generate it. So I was really proud of that. I, I don't speak French, I, I cannot tell how good this is. Um, it's, a very, it's a very simple model here, so we're not going for the best Google class. But this is only like one layer, right? So it's yeah. one layer of encoder, one layer of decoder, and we train it for only 10 epochs. And we say like this is kind of probably, yeah. I see like for the words I know, that looks pretty much decent. Yeah. But the, I think the main thing is you can tell it learned something from in, in the sense of doing yeah. translations. Well, what you see is from the decoder, if you say there's like a random, very random uh, s sequence of text, then it's maybe it's not learning something, but if it actually aligns to something similar to French. So it's a cool demo, right? Sort of, sort of translates, it's great. But I can imagine the hard part now is going to be, hey, I'm, maybe I want to do this like live, and then you need like a little bit more convincing than it sort of works in the notebook. So I can imagine you've yeah. through a lot of like you know applications with, with recurring and NLP stuff. The idea was we would make very simple notebooks that are easy to understand oh, no, rather I mean, than. And I totally get yeah. that. That's perfectly fine. But the question more is for you professionally. I can imagine that when you have models like this, like you probably need something really strict to convince yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you shed some light on that? Because I can imagine, especially for models like this, it's going to be really hard to convince stakeholders of doing the right thing. A lot of stuff can go wrong. Of course, yeah. If we're training on production, the first thing is that you would do more pre-processing so that you stream down to the domain that you really want to, right? Like, and the other thing is we probably will pile up being a more beefy models that, that predicts much better. Because this is only like trained on 10 times uh, on one layer. If you imagine that if we stack up three layers and then give it like uh, several thousand uh, round epochs of training, that will become much more like convincing of the output. You can also quantify the performance of this one in particular because you can use the blue score that would, so you can have like an actual validation set in. Oh, actually true, yeah. So you, you can, can use an existing. Optimize the performance like, a lot, I'm sure too. Data, data set that gives you this score blue. Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. How do you go from being constructed with you know, uh, complex learning chains? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you do, when you do pre processing, you're already like lowercase, remove softwares, et cetera, right? Those are stripped off. Um, what you can do, because in the well, end. I mean, I'm saying, you, I'm sure you, know, you can leave it the but, way it is with uppercase characters, but it was just to lower the dimensionality yeah. for this. Example, but of course, for a character model, especially, it's easy to just leave in all the special characters, all the capitalizations. If you have character level model, um, the downside is that your sequence would be much longer in this case, right? Because you have you know, single characters, but then you wouldn't have the problem of unknown, unknown tokens, and then you can leave in even caps because um, your size is just going to be caps and small letters and some numbers, etc. And I was still, for translation, I was still lowercase them if we are doing like word level, because um, you don't want the position of that word to, to become like a new vocab or somehow, right? So you want those two, like words to be very high, very high and overlapping, so that actually captures the, which position that should generate that word the best. Um, but I guess you can do some pre-processing for your predictions as well, that makes that into something that it can be seen as a proper text. Let's wrap up, maybe. How much? What the hell am I doing? All right, gotta, cool. Gotta go. Yeah. All right, so let's wrap up with the last session.
Wait, we don't have time. We got No. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, just fast forward to the end slide, and we'll just leave it there. Here. Yeah. Okay. This one? Just, next. Next. The very end. There. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs>